Hello everyone, this is Wen Ting Yu from Rutgers University in New Jersey, United States. Also, I'm a former alumni of Manus School of Music in New York City. First of all, I would like to express my highest gratitude to the Conero International Music Festival for having me to present my pedagogical lecture as one of the six pedagogy fellows. It is my huge honor and privilege to presenting my lecture, The Art of Collaboration, which will mainly focus on the teaching and practice of piano duet playing. There are two kinds of piano duets. A type of piano duet may involving two players to playing at the same piano simultaneously, which is so-called piano forehands. And a duet with the players playing separate instruments, not on the same piano, same instrument, was generally referred as two pianos. Firstly, I would like to introduce more about the history of the genre of the piano duet. The piano duet came to popularity about in the second half of the 18th century, when we so often see in the now generations of nowadays that Mozart played the duets as the child prodigy with his sister at Salzburg. And also Schubert was another composer who composed for the genre and really advocated himself into this style. Then the core idea or the so-called modern idea of the employment for two pianists may have to become and designed by Johann Sebastian Bach. And later on, Haydn and Beethoven may consider as have had little promotions or contributions to this special genre of piano duet. For example, Haydn really composed some pieces for four hands particularly, and also a divertisement, which was never published during his lifetime. And for Beethoven, he left one sonata and many marches and sets of variations, but none of which those pieces considered as um, so-called great importance to this whole repertory for the later generations. However, himself and his pieces were transcribed and being arranged by numerous and varied composers in the later periods. As for Mozart, his works definitely in this field as more significant values and glamorous, and usually played a lot. In another transition between classical and romantic period, Schubert, definitely among the best known composers, and made his fullest accomplishment of the original effect to this special genre for four hands. Later on, followed by the German Romantic composers, especially in the mid and late Romantic periods, Schumann and Johannes Brahms are the most outstanding contributions to this special genre. The idea was later carried out by Brahms, and who wrote two sets of waltzes for piano four hands, was also considered one of the best known of piano duets. In the meantime, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there are also some numerous composers who contributed the compositions to piano duets. For example, Grieg, Dvorak, and a French romantic composer like Faure and Bizet, and also transitioned to Debussy and Ravel, um, also to the early 20th centuries, Stravinsky and Bartok. There are also so many historical pianists who formed a team, or so-called piano duel, from the past to the present, including Mozart and his sister. And from the Romantic period to the 20th century, um, from Felix Mendelssohn and his sister, also Robert Schumann and his wife Clara Schumann. And when we arrive in the 20th century, there are so many uh, wonderful piano duels, and some of these teams focused exclusively 
or primarily on this repertoire, but some also appear separately as astonishing um, solo performers, solo pianists, and they often have very significant or uh, dazzling uh, professional careers as a solo performers. Among um, all the names from uh, the 20th century, including Robert and Gabby Casadesu, and the legendary Rosina and Joseph Levine, and um, the Ashkenazi and Previn, and also to the modern time, who are currently performing and uh, working together, uh, like Martha Arbridge and Nelson Fryer, and also their uh, Nuri Parakian and Radha Luke, who made wonderful recordings for this genre. As the purposes and the so-called mission for the music of the piano duet uh, really consists of uh, striking stylistic traits, including some original works and also arrangements or transcriptions from an orchestral or vocal compositions. And quite frankly, those stylistic traits so often in the relationship and in very close relationship to the purpose of this genre at the very beginning. Like those public majorities of the time, they would be no other way to hear or to have this access to many of the best known music. And like all Beethoven Ninth symphonies or Mahler symphonies, or Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, etc. And the only way, you know, and to do this is for this special genre of piano duet to offering more accessibility to the audiences and to the publics to play by themselves and domestic performances. This is also something to fit in uh, the salon culture of the uh, 19th century Europe as well. So. Among all these perspectives that I mentioned above, it is bringing us to a real essence of training for piano duet for different stages, also for different age levels. Personally, I particularly found that all these questions are so often being raised during solo piano teaching and solo piano performances. All of those things, however, if you started thinking about your piano learning and teaching in those categories, it will be more proactive about using the training process which focus in piano duet. It will resolve and improve those issues and technical challenges once we hit our plateaus. From my own teaching experiences, the one of the most crucial reasons is that students literally find it extremely fun and uh, so often found their uh, mysterious uh, discovery land besides the lonely and sometimes mechanical uh, solo practicing. Therefore, I always have this strong belief it's truly beneficial for us to raise up these musical and technical issues and within some inherently activities um, those quite motivational things and to let the students to listen better and to communicate better. We can always help our students to overcome their challenges by using piano duet playing and training. The students would easily uh, by accessing the piano duet playing to many different melodic ideas, those from uh, operas, uh, from symphonies or chamber musics, it, they will have a certain concept that how large is the range in different melodic ideas. They will balance them better through a piano duet playing. The training for harmony is really uh, helpful for um, performers at a very early stage or very early age level and because Sometimes you're not always going to play the melodic part or the melodic line uh, in the different sections, like in the primo part or in the secondo part uh, in a piano duet. Sometimes you got to play 
the single uh, harmonic lines or uh, harmonic bass lines, but sometimes could be active, but sometimes maybe sparse. And more importantly, which we experienced very less uh, in the solo performance, it's about the timbre and instrumentation. Uh, in a piano duet, or uh, either in uh, piano four hands or two pianos, it's very easy to, um, to do some fun instrumentations or orchestrations in, at the keyboard. So, um, like, what instruments or what types of instruments might be used uh, in this piece? Um, if you play a transcription from a, a, an orchestral work, or a opera, the students will be more sensitive and to more close to composers' original intentions about tone colors, about the timbres and the colors, and also for some textures. Again, if we play a transcription or arrangement, like say um, by playing a transcription on Beethoven symphonies or modern symphonies or uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Springs, um, the music textures, musical textures, um, may always be varied, you know, from monophony, homophony, or polyphonic music. How important and how difficult to train a student to have those polyphonic sense or contrapuntal uh, in a in a solo piece, in a solo work. So then I, I think the piano duet would be an excellent idea to train our contrapuntal concepts. Used to the technique of composing two or even more equally interesting melodies and that fit together you know, between two people. The students must to get to know at their early ages how to balance this symphonic instrument the multiple musical lines and certainly will enhance this kind of abilities during their solo piano playing. And also because of this instrument is such a symphonic and polyphonic instrument and people tend to play it either very loud or even percussive. So during a piano duet teaching and training between two people and between two parts, even though it's two pianos or uh, pre between primo and secondo parts, the students would listen better and they forced students to listen better and listen more actively rather than uh, passively because you have to, otherwise uh, it will be a chaotic or uh, a disastrous uh, result. Basically, we could categorize um, the different age levels or stages into four categories. Beginners, intermediate, advanced, and college level. For beginners, um, it is very crucial part you know, among all those four stages. First of all, the, for the beginner levels, not only uh, I'm saying by playing the piano duet at, for, as a beginners, but also for solo piano playing also as a beginners, those, uh, those are sometimes for the instructors building some fundamental interests and a solid or well-equipped introduction to this genre for their students and may starting to encourage them to play duet pieces with, uh, with the teacher or with the instructor during each lessons. It is um, very appropriate for pianists at the late elementary through inter intermediate levels. And during this stage, the duet repertoire may include from um, at the 18th and 19th and even uh, early 20th centuries, which those uh, famous and popular tunes those tuneful melodies and the folk songs and in, in a concise version. Um, as such composers like uh, by Diabelli, uh, Godowski, Haydn, uh, Moscheles, or even some early Mozarts. Um, and 
and, and more, and many others, composers as well, of course. Um, and then, when the students get into the intermediate level, this is really a time uh, for teachers to encouraging their students really try out some new repertoire on and some trained repertoire on stage, on the real stage. And instructors should organize and provide more real opportunities for students to perform with their early partners, start to having um, their own portfolios and experiences, and to communicate better and give comments and feedbacks to each other during each rehearsals, you know, and let them to uh, experience some rehearsing time uh, while uh, it's too early for a real um, uh, chamber uh, groups with string players and woodwinds players, but also looking uh, for their potential partners in later stages for piano duet. Um, in this uh, repertoire selection may include a variety of repertoire. Play um, waltzes, uh, dances, and marches, like marches by Schubert, uh, dances by Schubert, and, um, and also some waltzes uh, by uh, Johann Strauss and Diabelli. And the next level would be the advanced stage. At this stage, the students can always experience some new repertoire. For example, like transcriptions and the wonderful arranged works uh, for symphonies or opera or some based a theme from orchestral pieces or other uh, instruments or chamber music, quartets, uh, quintets, etc. This wonderful uh, repertory of transcriptions may include some technical challenges, sometimes maybe more virtuosic, but it really gives the students the opportunity to become much familiar with a broader range of literature and of course to experience those well-known, those most well-known pieces ever written in music history and or the, the those most uh, prestigious works in a more in-depth manner or more immediate manner. Those uh, suggested repertoire for this stage might include some opera scenes um, Johann Strauss or some waltzes from Johann Strauss and also some orchestra pieces by uh, Gamit Saint-Saëns and also some Ravel's orchestral works, you know, the transcriptions, and also our bench works. And finally, for the college level, uh, this level may include the most popular and prestigious classical and romantic repertoire. And it is appropriate, definitely appropriate, for early advanced to advanced pianists. Um, it may include even a much broader range of the repertoire and certainly should be covered uh, by uh, J.S. Bach, J.C. Bach and Beethoven's sonatas for piano for hands and Brahms waltzes and Hungarian dances and the Dvorak Slavonic dances um, and also Mozart sonatas for two pianos and for four hands um, and many others including some early 20th century, the French modernist, uh, for example, like Debussy's The Deep Suite and uh, Debussy's uh, Black and White and also some transcriptions and arranged works actually uh, by Ravel, but based on some um, major works of Debussy's like La Mer and also um, Nocturnes, etc. Of course, also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Franz Schubert was one of the most uh, prolific composers of the ensemble music and his most important works for piano duet are must be included in this level of training as the college level. Um, the, the certain, the typical example would be the F minor 
fantasy. And of course, it is always beneficial for this age levels or this stage of pianists to learn some rarely played pieces or not so often being in front of the spotlight. Uh, even like the new transcriptions or new arranged works and that could cover all periods, all different periods from Baroque um, to early 20th century and to mid -er, uh, 20th century and even late 20th century and also 21st century. And that's broader sense of piano duet literature. It is really a vital uh, thing to be explored. Some useful sources uh, will always be available uh, to our students and instructors. And one of the uh, also the public domains will be the imslp.org. Uh, uh, that's a wonderful source and has a, uh, considered as a dazzling uh, treasure uh, for people to invest and contribute this piano duet. And they have wonderful catalogs. Overall, I hope my lecture today provides some useful instructions and helpful suggestions along with a clearer direction into the world of piano duet for our instructors, students, and also for the parents. We should never ignore the beauty and advantages of this genre, or treat it simply as a side dish to your soul of mine. Especially in this modern age, everyone are so tightly to everyone. And people should build and develop this mutual trust during a duet playing and cherish and to feel this ultimate joy of this trust and musical communication. That's why we call it the art of collaboration. Thank you so much for watching and I'm wishing everyone stay safe, stay healthy and be productive, be positive. Thank you. Hello. And welcome to my lecture about approaching postal music. Uh, my name is Alejandro Avila. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Kansas. And it's really my pleasure to present this topic. Uh, I hope you enjoy. And especially you learn something out of this. So let's get started. What are we going to talk about? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, as an introduction, I would like to just spend a couple of minutes talking about the importance of expanding the main canon of repertoire and why is it relevant for a topic like the one that I'm presented to be considered. Uh, the different approaches to post-tonal analysis and especially the ones that are different from tonal approaches, I'm going to be very specific about ways we deal, understand and study this type of repertoire. And particularly, I'm going to be focusing on two pieces. One that can be utilized for uh, beginner or inter intermediate level students. And a second piece that is more towards um, advanced level students. As a conclusion, I would suggest a couple of memori memorization tips, as well as some general suggestions for uh, teachings and students like uh, about this repertoire, what they can do with it, and why is it important to talk, to study them, and to even perform them nowadays. So let's get started with the importance about the, expanding the main canon. So what I truly believe is that nowadays we are at a point where the saturation of standard repertoire in concert programs is um, very common. We, we see that uh, worldwide and very important artists are expanding their concert programs um, to search for pieces that um, are not very represented all the time or or pieces that uh, that can relate to a society nowadays so we really see uh, that people and, and particularly pianists are looking uh, to expand that repertoire um, the early exposition to, of, of students to this type of music, uh, what we call new music or contemporary works, it's, it's really important. It, it helps to the development of their oral skills and, and also the appreciation of, of the different music eras. 
And in the need of uh, 20th or 21st century pieces in entrance exams, competitions, and concert programs, is it's a reality. We see that a lot of universities, music schools, uh, colleges, conservatories are asking for contemporary works, for modern works. So understanding these works and, and knowing how to teach them or, or knowing how to approach them if you are a professional pianist is really important for your career. Um, as I mentioned before, the social and cultural relevance that um, studying and presenting these pieces to audiences, um, it's, it's, it's growing and growing. People are really looking at a mother music as, as a way to actually portray um, the, the issues that are going on in society. And, and I believe that a good way to do that is actually try to find these works that are sometimes um, underrepresented. So that's a, just a little bit of the overview why why I believe talking about a, a topic like this is it's really important nowadays. Now let's talk a, a little bit about the approach to this music. So in order for us to analyze and, and to know how to teach this music, um, there are a couple of um, different ways we can we can actually deal with this music. Um, there's one thing, a very practical way that we call pitch class collections. So uh, it's going to be a little bit technical. Uh, so try to s stay here with me. Uh, I promise you, uh, I'm going to lead the way very smoothly. It's not not going to get boring or anything. But we're going to be essentially talking about numbers just for a little while uh, and how we assign these specific numbers to our notes instead of calling things C, D, and E. We're going to call them zero to four and so on but I, i'm going to explain a little bit about that um, in a bit uh, another way to approach this music is uh, what i call singable patterns so uh, a lot of times we tend to think about this music as uh, completely atonal or or not singable not pretty that they don't have really a melody but um, you, you would be surprised how how melodic some of these composers that really are so uh, what I tend to do is have a, a type of singable pattern, uh, a, a singable approach where I would sing out loud my uh, a specific melody to in order to memorize it. Um, it is a chromatic type of analysis, so a lot of this music also deals um, with chromaticisms quite quite thoroughly. So understanding how that relates to music, it's it's quite relevant. Uh, transposition is the most common thing. Uh, we would have, for example, a specific um, pitch class set or a prime form, uh, specific numbers, let's say, or, or, or group of notes that are exactly transposed um, up a fourth or down a fifth, down a third, up a second, and, and different, different transpositions throughout a piece. So if we know how to uh, break down the music and identify those, um, the the whole learning process tend to be faster, uh, more effective. Uh, so these are um, some ways that this music can can be approached, and and there are the the things and the the, the actually approaches that I I found to be useful for me. So let's get started with the analysis of actual pieces and how these different approaches actually uh, work with music. So Bartok tends to be a composer that. Um, uh, teachers uh, use as a as a as a way to introduce to uh, modern music, and it's a good one. It's a good one, uh, but um, sometimes we just forget um, about easier ways uh, to actually deal with this type of music. Um, we tend to rely a lot on, on on repetition, and and just have our students to uh, repeat constantly and constantly uh, the same patterns without actually breaking breaking it down for them and and having realized how how this music is constructed that's why it's important to really analyze um, let's go a little bit about the the type of analysis that I work um, in here so you probably noticed that I wrote down some numbers and that's um, the first type of approach that I talk about the uh, pitch class collection essentially we find our, our prime form and and we associate specific notes um, to numbers. Um, it's a little bit tricky to understand. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but a, a really simple way to 
see it is um, we assign uh, in a, a, any given scale uh, number zero to our origin node. Uh, let's take this excerpt right here, A up to D. So zero would be our A, our departing node, the first one on the right hand. And from that point, it goes in semitones or uh, half steps. So essentially, we have A as zero. Then our B flat or A sharp would be one. Then B is two, C is three, C sharp or D flat four, and our D five. That's why we have that number in here, zero, two, three, five. So essentially we are dealing only with that note, with those notes, excuse me, from that A all the way until the end of that first uh, phrase. So we only have notes A, B, C, and D, zero, two, three, five. And why is it really important to give them numbers? Why don't we just call it, call them A, B, C, D, right? Uh, well, essentially it's to find the connections that there are throughout the piece. So you can see that I also put the same numbers on this ones. So the next motive of, on the right hand, starting on this measure, and it goes all the way until the end of what I call A section before this B, so up until that E flat, is exactly the same type of um, pitch class collection. So we have the same type of intervals from A to B, there's a whole step, from E flat to F, the same thing. That's I assign a zero to E flat, then my F will be two, G flat three, and A flat five. So this is a really go, a good way to understand their relationships. The first one to this one. And that's when, when we can combine them with other approaches. For example, uh, the singable, um, singable pattern that I, that, that I call it. Uh, a lot of students tend to rely a lot of, on oral skills and, and, and hearing things. Of course, when we combine voices, it sounds pretty dissonant, right? Yeah, I have the score in front of me, but I wasn't using it. Um, anyways, but if we actually break it down and only um, work on the melody, only on the right hand, quite nice quite pleasant melody nothing too weird about it the thing comes when you combine it with the left hand same thing would be applied for the next couple of measures on here the right hand goes so having having the students to sing out loud those melodies, um, they start noticing the similarities. They start noticing um, how the patterns are actually equivalent. And, and you don't need, you, as an instructor, you don't even need to go uh, to the technicality of it. You don't need to explain to them, okay, this is the same um, pitch class collection as, uh, you know, the one in the beginning, that the one here. No. That's for a professional pianist or, or, or perhaps for an instructor to have as a knowledge, but um, just having them work um, in in that way to break it down into very specific uh, patterns and and having them notice in the the similarities and, and not only similarities in this case is the the exact same pitch class set. So um, having them practicing in that way it really boosts memorization. Um, it, it helps also like an interpretation tool so uh, we can actually uh, associate those different motives that are basically just transposed um, up a fourth, right? We start on the F and then the other one starts on the E flat. So it's uh, diminished fifth or augmented fourth. Um, let's go and jump ahead to our more advanced piece. So this is probably something that you represent a very advanced student or something that you would even work as a professional pianist is the Albenberg Sonata Opus 1. Um, Albenberg, Austrian composer of the 20th century and part of the second violinist school. Um, 
a really relevant and important composers for for to post-tonal music, as well as Bartok, uh, just in, in in different ways. Let me just play it for you. Um, you have the first two systems there. We can use in this uh, at first, you know, we just hear the music, um, we concentrate on the beauty of the sounds, and we can think uh, about many ways that's challenging or hard to understand, um, contrasting that to maybe um, beginnings of Mozart's, Beethoven's sonatas. Uh, but it, actually, the associations that Berg um, utilizes throughout the piece are there are small cells that are fully exploited throughout the work. And let's start by just analyzing this first gesture here. Notice this pattern of um, the chromatic line that goes from that C sharp all the way to the A sharp here. Just to form the perfect dominant chord there. And resolve it into the B minor cadence we have um, at the beginning so this is a, a good way to just uh, solve a lot of issues and solve and, and save a lot of time too just learning that chromatic line right away um, solves most of the issues right so then we go to the right hand for example and we have another thing to consider there um, in terms of chromaticism uh, first let's see just the upper line here we have a pattern that will be f fully explored if you know the piece um, several times in different ways. Let's say that it goes up to that uh, C sharp and kind of like um, leads the way first, but then um, has the middle voice to takes over into that resolution. But notice this G and B here. So our G is actually going to work as our ground note that throughout this measure. And we're going to have the other one, the B, to have a very similar chromatic pattern as we had in here at the beginning on the bass. So it's going to go A, B flat, A natural. Then they both kind of like uh, blend into together to go to G sharp, G natural again, until we resolve it with the F sharp extremely again extremely clear the line of chromaticism um, when we break down the music that way we can actually see how a composer um, deals with music and how 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 they actually have a cell or an idea a motive in mind and they just take advantage of the compositional devices they have in order to create uh, the piece the whole thing is constructed that way we can see again from here on, notice that we have our B, right, as uh, the end of that first cadence. Then the C takes over. Up all the way until the F, and it continues. F sharp, G, G sharp, A. So the chromaticism is over and over repeated. Uh, again, here we have our motive, but inverted instead of... And here we have B, F sharp, F. So again, we can um, utilize our singable pattern um, technique as a way to remember that motive. B, da, 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 B, da, da. And there are multiple ways it appears throughout the piece. Um, here, we can use the pitch class collection to analyze those. They're gonna be transpose, transposely equivalent again. Um, and Alban Berg couldn't be more obvious with this one when talking about um, chromaticism, right? And on. So why am I talking about this? Why is it 
good to, or, or even relevant to um, learn these techniques to deal with this repertoire. Essentially, not, not only as performers, but as teachers, we, we need to know how music is constructed. We need to know, we need to find effective ways um, to teach our students, to have them learn this repertoire uh, faster, uh, more accurately. And, and create ways in in which their performance would be more engaging to audiences. So I want to conclude uh, today's lecture by just giving you a couple of um, memorization tips. Um, singing out loud really helped me, and I think it really helps my students to memorize this um, these patterns. Um, analyze and compare the pitch escalation as we just did. That's a, an effective way in which um, students can quickly memorize patterns and, and pieces of music like um, the ones that we saw today. The isolation of motive and, and the contrast with the different transposition is really a, um, a good way. Um, just, just take a specific uh, passage and, and see how that relates to what happens, for example, on the third or fourth page and things like that. Uh, choosing random pickup points to start the practice time is, is also very effective. So if a memory slip happens throughout a performance, they have all these different starting points where, where they can grab and, and just keep going. Um, and finally, just uh, general suggestions for, for students and teachers that are watching this. Uh, please don't be afraid of exploring this, uh, this repertoire. Uh, new music or what we call contemporary pieces. Um, are really sometimes underrepresented and of course they always is going to be up to taste and what the, the the teacher or the or the students wants to do but really exploring this work is is not as challenging as sometimes appears and i myself i i, I didn't i wasn't exposed to this type of music before and i um, started to acquire um, a taste for it um, in the past few years so I would really recommend you to explore this music and and especially don't be afraid of it and the early exposition I, I truly believe uh, benefits a lot of uh, the students that uh, not only for the comprehension but also like the techniques that are utilized um, combination of the different approaches that we saw today can actually also benefit the understanding of forms and structure so for example if a student is um, working on a Bach prelude or a Chopin prelude, you can uh, expose them to a Messian prelude and they can see how, how the genre developed throughout time and what's the take on each um, composer, how, how they develop the genre in their own way. And finally, <clears throat> try to include one piece of, uh, of this type of repertoire um, within your own concert program or, or for your students. It's, Again, this is not a, a call for um, only only do this type of repertoire. I'm a truly believer that uh, students should should keep doing Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, um, all the standard repertoire. But also exposition to to this um, to this music can can benefit greatly. Well, thank you. I hope you have a great music festival. Take advantage of all the lectures. Um, all the programs, uh, the recitals, and and the master classes that are going to be. Um, have a great time, and I hope you really enjoy this, and especially you, you could learn something out of this uh, lecture today. So thank you for staying with me and watching. Um, have a great music festival. Bye. 大家好,我是欧阳雨迪,很高兴得到克雷诺钢琴艺术节的邀请,在这里和大家分享一些 我自己在钢琴教室中的心得和体会。那么今天给大家带来的讲座主要是想探讨如何让一堂钢琴课变得更加高效，如何更好的将抽象思维转化成具象呈现。将怎么想变成怎么谈？音乐本身呢是一个
啊，或者用绘画、用景象去描述一段音乐，甚至将自己想象成作曲家，去感同身受他当时的情绪和心理活动。又或者将自己的情感带入到音乐中去表达。那么，以上我们所说的种种，都是如何从抽象层面去理解音乐、去表达音乐。那么，在钢琴教学中很重要的一点，就是如何用具象的语言去引导学生，通过触键方法的变化，通过弹性时间的运用，通过肢体协调的配合等等，啊，去将我们想象的情感和画面。弹出来，给具象呈现出来。那么接下来我们会通过几个具体的例子来探讨如何更好的将抽象思维转化成具象呈现。好，我们看到第一个例子，李斯特的但丁读后感。那么现在我们看到的这一段是第二主题之前的一段，主要描述的是但丁在地狱中昏厥过去了，然后他看到一个幻象，啊，这个幻象中是他最心爱的人。b e a t r i c 那么整个这一段的氛围是非常唯美的，非常梦幻的，然后还有一点神秘。那么我们现在先来听一听。修指符的时候，在延长技巧的时候，我的手的移动速率是非常慢的，移动到下一个位置。那么现在我再示范一次。
在这么快的移动速率的情况下，啊，我的手的路线仍然走的是个圆弧形的，啊，我并不是在琴键上横向的直来直去，啊，其实横向的直来直去这个动作非常容易让手臂、手腕变得僵硬，啊，变得紧张，而且即使是弹不快的，啊，所以在这里，啊，要告诉大家一点就是，我们即使在非常快的移动速率的情况下，我们的手的路线仍然要走一个圆弧形的，啊，人要画个圆弧形。啊，这样可以让手臂、手腕啊更舒服、更容易放松。好，我们现在看到第二个例子。当我们谈到一首作品中很重要的和声变化的时候，我们经常会要求学生要弹出色彩的变化，要弹出明暗的变化。啊、那么其实这个色彩的变化到底怎么弹出来？我想其实很多学生都不太理解。那么色彩的变化，它不仅仅等于力度的变化，其实更关键的诀窍在于我们对于时间的运用。啊，那么首先，请大家来听一段来自乔治·格什温的这首非常具有爵士风格的作品。在刚刚我在，呃，这一段的非常重要的和声变化的时候，我不仅仅做了一个突落，也就是说，我不仅仅做的是力度的变化，那么更关键的是，我在进入下一个和声之前呢，稍微延迟了那么零点一秒或者零点二秒，而就是这时间上的延迟，时间上的变化，啊，产生了我们所说的色彩变化的效果，啊，那么现在我再示范一遍，那这一遍呢？我只做力度的变化，不做时间的变化，大家听一听是什么样的效果。变化加上之后，啊，这个效果就立马不一样了。所以，色彩的变化包含我们所说的好几个不同的部分组成。首先是力度的变化，然后是我们刚讲的时间的变化。那么这中间肯定还包含了触键的变化、用力的变化。那么种种这些因素组合在一起，就构成和组成了我们所说的色彩变化。我们现在看到第三个例子，也是我们经常会遇到的问题，就是力度很小的和弦怎么弹？比如我们这首非常耳熟能详的柴可夫斯基的第一钢琴协奏曲的开头。学生要弹的声如洪钟，啊，这个声音要传得远，传得宽，啊，既要饱满又不能尖锐。而实际上，这个和弦的弹法，这个操作是非常复杂的，所以我们一定要给学生解释清楚，身体的每个部位到底是怎么参与用力的，而且这个力量又是怎么发出来的。啊，为什么有的同学弹这个和弦他声音弹不出来？啊，是因为太瘦吗？是因为没有力气吗？啊，其实不是。啊，关键在于我们要知道身体的每个部位到底是怎么用的。那么我们现在从下往上来说，啊，首先是双脚，啊
啊，这个是很多人忽略的。总觉得我们用手弹琴嘛，那脚除了踩踏板，好像也没什么用了啊。其实这个双脚是非常重要的支撑点，只有你的双脚支撑住了，我们后面这些部位才有支点可以用来发力啊。所以双脚是非常重要的，一定要支撑好。那么我们再往上看，我们看到这个胯骨啊，胯骨是一个非常重要的发力点。我们弹这样的和弦的时候，你不能是很悠闲的坐着。啊，不能是没有知觉的坐在这儿，你的胯骨是一定要有意识的主动向前稍微倾斜，啊，这个是一个主动的发力点。那么我们再往上，腰、背、肩膀，啊，这个更不用说了，这个是非常主要的发力点。那么再到大臂、小臂、手腕、掌关节，在最后传递到指尖。啊，那为什么有的同学他弹这样的和弦声音出不来？啊，很多时候因为他往往只用到了大臂以前的。重量啊，大概是这样弹。啊，只用到大臂以前的重量，那你声音肯定是出不来的。那么现在我们把刚刚我们讲的这些，从双脚到胯骨到腰背、肩膀啊这些身体的部位全部用上，大家再听听看这个声音的区别。关键在于我们怎么样弹出这个宏伟的、气势磅礴的、辉煌的声音。我们要把身体的这些部位啊，该怎么用，一定要了解清楚。哪些部位参与用力，这个力怎么发出来，我们最后才能达到我们所需要的声音。那么我们看到最后一个例子，也是一首非常经典的中国作品《浏阳河》。那么我们在谈到《浏阳河》这首作品的时候，我们经常给学生讲解啊，这个声音要弹的悠扬婉转、柔美歌唱，要模仿流水的声音啊，还要弹的有感情。那么我们到底怎么弹出悠扬婉转的歌唱的声音啊？怎么把声音弹的有感情啊？很多学生他是这么弹。声音呢，就是硬邦邦的，既不婉转，也不歌唱，也没有感情。啊，那么实际上呢，我们应该这样弹。解决问题的关键呢，其实有好几个方面，包括我们之前所讲的时间的运用，啊，比如延迟进入，比如弹性速度的运用，啊，还包括听觉的方面，比如我们内心的预听觉，比如弹完音之后耳朵的监听，好，那么今天我主要想讲另外两个方面，第一个就是手腕的作用，好，我经常是这样给学生解释的，我们要想象手腕像汽车的避震器。或者你把它理解成一块海绵，它可以让力量软着陆。那么大家可以观察到，我刚在弹的时候，我的手腕会有一个曲线的动作。啊，就是这个曲线的动作，要让本来直接出去的力量能够得到缓冲。那么我们出来的声音呢，就不会太冲。太直，好，这是第一点。第二点就是我们经常所讲的触键速度，啊，那我是让学生要想象啊，我们的手指在一碗热巧克力里面，或者在一碗蜂蜜里面，体会手指在一种浓稠的、有阻力的状态下弹的感觉。那么这个感觉，这个状态就是我们所说的慢触键的状态。那么在我们刚弹这一段的时候。
，我们的手指并不是第一时间就把琴键弹到底，啊，不是这样。这样出来的声音就很直，我们是慢慢的把琴键放下去，啊，那么这样的出来的声音就会很柔和，啊，所以手腕的作用加上慢触键这两个加在一起，就基本构成了一个婉转的歌唱声音。那么再加上我们之前讲的时间的运用，啊，听觉的运用。内心听觉，还有耳朵的听觉，这些东西全部的因素加在一起，最后就能得出我们想要的声音。好，那么今天的讲座呢，通过以上几个例子，主要跟大家探讨了，在钢琴教学中，除了从抽象思维上引导学生去理解音乐、去表达音乐，啊，更需要我们通过具象的语言和方式，让学生尽可能的理解。如何通过不同的弹奏方法，啊，来让声音、让情感更好的呈现出来？谢谢大家。Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel Coletti, and I'd like to start by thanking the Conroe Music Festival for this opportunity to present to you all virtually. And I'm sorry I can't see you in person in Conroe, Italy, this summer. The topic of my presentation. Is intermediate piano repertoire by Czech composers. I titled my presentation "Czech Gems" because, despite there being plenty of well-written and high-quality Czech pieces in the piano repertoire, they are very rarely taught or performed. As a teacher, I'm always trying to find distinct choices of repertoire for my students, and I believe the pieces I will introduce to you today. Are valuable pedagogical resources. I will offer a brief pedagogical analysis of each piece and discuss their artistic and technical merits to show how they can be useful to piano teachers. It is difficult to isolate musical devices that are exclusively used in Czech music. However, a common theme is the incorporation of folk elements in all levels of composition. For example, it is common for Czech composers to include direct quotations of historic Czech melodies. You will also see that they often reference Czech nature, daily life, fairy tales and myths, and Czech historical figures and events. The Czech language places stress on the first syllable of each word, and many composers reflect this in their music by placing accents on the first beats. Structural and rhythmic forms are often based on Czech dance styles, such as the polka, the furiant, the dumka, and the sausatska. Smetna was. The first to aggressively implement a combination of these folk elements in his music, which resulted in the creation of a characteristic Czech national style of music. He subsequently had an undeniable influence on all of the great Czech composers who came after him. I will include works by the following six composers in chronological order. Beginning with Smetna, then Dvorak, Fibich, Suk, Janáček, and Martinu. While there were many great Czech composers who came before him, Smetna is considered the father of Czech music, which is why I decided to start with him. Most of these pieces I will discuss today I have taught my students, so I will speak from my own personal teaching experience. In fact, a few of my students learned these pieces in the last few weeks in online piano lessons this summer, and I will include a few of their recordings in my presentation. This piece 
Chanson Opus 2, Number 2, features a lyrical melody over rolling arpeggios passing between both hands. It is clear in this piece that Smetna was influenced by other Romantic composers like Chopin and Liszt. This piece would be a useful preparation for studying a piece like Schumann's Kindred Seinen, as the sections from foreign lands and peoples and the poet speaks feature a similar accompanimental pattern. This piece is also good training for developing independence of the separate voices, creating a smooth legato line in the melody, playing with effective tempo rubato, and discussing how the harmonic changes create tension in the melody. this piece particularly fascinating is that Dvorak wrote it during his stay in the United States. He was influenced by the sounds of black melodies and spirituals which he grew to love during his time here. While this piece incorporates Czech dance sounds, it is also heavily influenced by American stride style of piano playing. This unique combination of influences would make this piece a great choice for a student who's interested in jazz. It's also a good opportunity to discuss chord voicing as well as a chance to introduce rondo form. Fibich was the son of a forester, so he spent much of his childhood in lodges deep in the woods. The nature of Bohemia remained an important inspiration for him throughout his life, which is shown in his romantic style compositions. This sonatina in D minor is in three movements. The first and second movements feature rhapsodic, haunting melodies. And the third movement is a bombastic dance featuring many hemiolas. This piece would be an excellent choice for a young student who is ready to play a sonatina but may prefer a more romantic option over a traditional classical sonatina. This piece comes from Fibich's collection of piano miniatures called Moods, Impressions, and Reminiscences, which functions as an intimate musical diary. This poem is a short and personal work, featuring a melody under repeated chords in the accompaniment. A few technical considerations are the leaps in the left hand, the balance between the melody and accompaniment, and the pacing of dynamics to shape the long melody line. This poem would make an excellent preparation piece for the Chopin Preludes, as it uses similar techniques as Chopin Prelude Number no. 9 in E major, as well as Chopin Prelude Number no. 17 in A flat major. students, and he was considered a leading composer of Czech modernism. This piece was inspired by a Czech winter scene and would pair well with any Chopin waltz, as the left-hand leaps are good preparation for a more challenging waltz-style piece. The melody is harmonized in unexpected ways, which gives the opportunity to discuss how Suk creates tension and resolution in this piece.
A blown away leaf comes from Nanachek's collection called On an Overgrown Path, which is another Czech work that is inspired by nature. This piece is intimate, reserved, and patient. A few challenges include the changing time signature, which gives the piece a sense of timelessness. It also contains large left-hand leaps and requires special attention to chordal voicing and the division of left-hand and right-hand notes. The whimsical nature and use of expanded tonality would make this piece a good introduction for some of Scriabin's earlier works. Martinus' Why Shouldn't We Play with Soldiers incorporates interval sizes mainly of a fourth to a sixth, making this work accessible to the typical intermediate level student. It is a playful march filled with juxtaposing staccato and legato markings and with strong dynamic contrasts. This piece would be a good exercise in the differentiation and exaggeration of articulation markings, as Martineau is very detailed and specific with his indications on the score. It would also be a good opportunity to teach about the relationship between parallel minor and major modes, as the opening theme repeats in the parallel major and the middle of the piece. called puppets. Each piece captures a different character. A few titles include The New Puppet, The Shy Puppet, and The Sick Puppet. This particular piece is in the form of a waltz and features many twirling phrases. No two are alike, which creates the opportunity to encourage students to be creative in their interpretations. Martineau studied in Paris, and his admiration of French music is apparent in this piece. This waltz would be a good stepping stone before playing a larger work like Debussy's Valse Romantique. There are many benefits to studying these pieces. Firstly, they have a wide variety of technical and artistic demands, making them unique additions for teachers to broaden their students' repertoire. Because they aren't well known, it can be a rewarding experience for students to make the piece feel like their own through their interpretive decisions. In a festival or competition setting, a lesser known work will make a more refreshing and memorable impression on audience members and adjudicators alike. Students will enjoy the rhythmic dance elements as well as enjoy learning about the folk derivations of Czech music. Furthermore, these Czech composers were great admirers of and friends with composers like Schumann, Brahms, Chopin, Liszt, Mendelssohn and Tchaikovsky. For this reason, these compositions will help students prepare for more advanced large-scale repertoire. These pieces can function as standalone works to be included in a studio recital or a festival performance. They can also be inserted as the opening or closing piece of a larger solo recital program. Because they are shorter works, they can be assigned as a study piece to focus on improving a specific technical skill or deepening the student's understanding of a certain musical concept. For more advanced students, 
They can be assigned as a group or even as a complete set to be performed all together. Fortunately, almost all the pieces I've spoken about today come from larger collections, which gives you all the opportunity to explore even more Czech repertoire. In conclusion, an analysis proves that these pieces have great value for both teaching and performing. Students can gain valuable experience playing Czech musical styles, broaden their repertoire, deepen their technical ability, and they will be better prepared to learn larger scale piano works. I hope you all have enjoyed learning about this repertoire as much as I have. Thank you all so much for watching. Hello everyone in front of the screen. My name is Shi Chao Zhang, a doctor of musical arts in piano performance and literature from the Eastman School of Music in the United States. I'm deeply honored to be invited to do this online lecture at the Conero Music Festival. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to professors Chai Tsong Tsong and Ivy. Before I start, I'd like to say a few words about my current situation. I'm currently in Xinjiang Ulumqi. The city is locked down and everyone's self-quarantined at home because of the resurgence of the COVID-19. So I apologize that I do not have a better recording environment and my piano is not in an ideal condition to make this video. So I have to use some clips from my old performance. Thank you very much for your understanding. Today, I'm going to talk about Beethoven's Sonata in A flat major, Opus 110, the second in the trinity of the final three sonatas. Opus 109, Opus 110, Opus 111. These three sonatas are significant for their invention, boldness, and innovation, but what's more extraordinary is their profundity. Through this lecture, we're going to explore this astounding sonata that represents Beethoven's highest level of compositional skills and his brilliant integration of lyricism, humor, and philosophical depth. Today, I'm going to focus on two main topics. First, formal structure, and second, practicing and teaching suggestions. Now let's look into the details. This sonata was composed in 1821 and is in three movements. The first movement, Moderato Cantabile Moto Esplessivo, is in sonata form, followed by the second movement, Allegro Moto, which is a fast scherzo movement. The final movement is a little bit complex, because it comprises a slow recitative and arioso dolente, a fugue, a return of the arioso lament, and a second fugue that builds to an affirmative conclusion. Beethoven in his late period often writes big fugal sections in his sonatas, which are strongly associated with the Baroque era. So this piece is undeniably visionary, but also has a certain retrospective quality in it. What Opus 110 does share with Opus 109 and Opus 111, and also with so many of Beethoven's late works, is that it grows in scope as it progresses. In order to really realize Beethoven's genius plan and scheme in this composition at a bigger picture, we have to look at the main themes and motives of the sonata as a whole and see how do they develop throughout the piece and unify the entire sonata. There are three significant unifying features in this sonata. First, the main theme of the sonata in all movements actually all derived from the hexachord, meaning the first six notes of the diatonic scale. And the main themes of each movement begin with a phrase covering the range of a sixth. Second, the intervals of the descending third and the ascending fourth. Third, the significance of the note F which is the sixth degree of the A-flat major scale. Now, let's look at the detailed examples with the music score to get a clearer idea. Now, at the beginning of the first movement, the opening phrase is thus.
In this opening phrase, as we can see on the score, it ranges from A flat to F, which is a sixth, and covers all six notes in the hexachord, A flat, B flat, C, D flat, E flat, and F, if we put these notes in ascending direction. Also, if we look at the intervals, it begins with a descending third from C to A flat, and then followed by an ascending fourth from A flat to D flat, then down a third, then up a fourth. Please keep this intervallic motion in mind, as we will see the same motion again in a later movement. Speaking of the importance of the note F, as we can see and hear, it forms the peak of the first phrase of the sonata. In the second movement, the opening phrase, first four measures cover a descending hexachord C, B flat, A flat, G, F, and E. The note F serves as the tonic in this movement and also marks the starting note of the trio section. And the third movement begins with the note F. After that, the first phrase in the arioso is another descending hexachord E flat, D flat, C flat, B flat, A flat, and G, as we can hear in this video. This is similar to the second arioso later in the movement, so I'm going to skip the second arioso. Now let's take a look at the two fugal sections. There's a very clever design here in the fugues. The first fugue here. As we can see, the subject of this fugue is La, Re, Si, Mi, Do, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. This is not only derived from the hexachord, but also reflects the ascending fourth, descending third intervallic motion, just like the beginning of the first movement. The second fugue. This fugue begins with the inversion of the subject from the first fugue. The hexachord now goes down a sixth from D to F sharp, and instead of up a fourth, down a third, the intervallic motion in this subject is down a fourth, up a third. By looking through the themes in each movement, we should now have a clearer picture about how did Beethoven employ a simple motivic idea throughout all movements and unify the sonata in its entirety. Now let's dig into the details in each movement and also look at some key points for practicing and teaching. The first movement is marked moderato cantabile molto espressivo, meaning at a moderate speed, in a singing style, very expressively. This movement is extraordinary for its beauty, tenderness, gentleness, and its depth of feeling, but structurally it is conventional. It's a typical sonata form with an average length, with all the sections and events you would expect. It has a tremendous warmth that Beethoven asks for explicitly. He writes con amabilità and soft at the beginning. This is another one of those late pieces with both Italian and German markings. We need to remember, it does not mean soft. Probably tender or gentle is a better sense here. You should keep in mind that this is not a sonata allegro movement, and Beethoven's tempo marking makes a clear statement that this movement has its unique unhurried path. The first page of the sonata contains three significantly important factors when we play Beethoven's music, 
they are contabile and simplicity, precision of the tempo, and precision of markings. After the opening four measures, here comes a seven-bar phrase that has a steady accompaniment. This seven-bar phrase needs to be played with simplicity, avoid being sentiment, but still with singing quality. The articulation dynamic markings need to be carefully observed. For example, measure 10 and measure 3 have the same melody, same articulation, and both have a crescendo. However, they are followed by completely different emotions. The first time in measure 4, the crescendo never comes to fruition. Where it should peak, Beethoven gives us a subito piano and then stretches time with a fermata on the trail. And the second time in measure 11, this time the crescendo does come to combination with a sforzando marking. All of those markings, the slurs, the portato, the crescendo, the subito piano, the sforzando, all of this has to be precisely recognized and performed. Starting from measure 12, the entire section with the 32nd notes has to be in the same tempo with the previous phrase that has 16th note accompaniment, which also has to be in the same tempo with the beginning. One practical advice on how to set up a tempo is we should always think about the pause in the following sections before we start to play the first note. So in this piece, we should always think about the tempo and pause in measure 5 and measure 12 and use that same tempo to begin the opening phrase. Now let's move to the development section. The development of this first movement is an extreme manifestation of the movement as a whole. It is very compact, and the modulation develops rather quickly. The transformation of the opening theme is extraordinary here. The first two bars, measures 40 and 41, have the exact same melodic notes as the beginning of the piece. But now in F minor, the context is completely different. The development section gives a new, heavy, dark, insistent character, and Beethoven gives this version of the theme a non-stop 16th single note accompaniment. It is quite a challenge on how to keep this section interesting to the audience, because the melodic content and the accompaniment pattern are basically all the same. Therefore, we need to be very sensitive about the harmonic shifts and really experience the different harmonies. In addition, Beethoven uses six pairs of hairpins in this section, and if, if we pay very close attention to them, we will see that the highest point of each pair of the hairpins is not always on the same beat. Again, this is about the precision of square reading. However, we should not forget that simplicity is still important here. The best recipe for the interpretation of such music is let it alone. Sing the passage before we play and carefully listen to the sound we make. Control the sound carefully and let the natural weight fall into, into the keys without pressing. The hairpins are not big crescendos and diminuendos. The hairpins are more like a movement of the, of the inflections. So let it be, let the music flow naturally without hurrying and drifting into inaccuracies. And always, always avoid rough and shallow touch. When I play the sonata, I always think that the first two movements should be played ataka. That is, there should be no pause or relaxation between these two movements. Even though it is not clearly marked with the written word attacca, the first movement's ambiguous ending with an imperfect cadence, plus the very first note in the second movement, C, is the same as the last note in the first movement. All of these su suggests that these two movements might belong together. The toughness and the radical motion in the second movement is the complete opposite compared to the first movement. It is like yin-yang relationship between the two movements. 
second movement here is in a strict ABA form, very different from the first and third movement's philosophical profundity. This second movement is brief and humorous, even though it's in the minor key. The rhythm is complex with many syncopations and ambiguities. Therefore, the tempo needs to be very steady in order to make the syncopations accurate. Martin Cooper, in his book, Beethoven, The Last Decade, writes that he finds Beethoven here indulged the rougher side of his humor by using two German folk songs. One is translated to, our cat has had kittens, and this can be found in measures one through four. And the other is called, ich bin luderlich, du bist luderlich, translated as, I am a slob, you are a slob. And this can be found in measures 17 through 20. In fact, Beethoven had also written a song by using the first folk tune. Let's take a listen. Unser Katz hat Katzen gehabt, drei und sechs in meine Ohren, so der Ringerlauf, das ist schon das meine. Unser Katz hat Katzen gehabt, drei und sechs in meine Ohren, so der Ringerlauf, das ist schon das meine. Some of you may agree and some of you may disagree that there's some kind of connection between the folk tune and the sonata second movement. And I won't say that Beethoven necessarily was thinking about these folk tunes when he was writing this movement. But it is undeniable that these folk tunes exist. And it is quite noteworthy that Beethoven would think about and quote these folk tunes in a serious composition. That proves humor is a significant component in Beethoven's character. The trio section is quite a challenge to play. I should remind ourselves that no matter how difficult this section is, we will still need to be precise about markings. It is important to take the left hand seriously and accurately keep the full value of the quarter notes. There's no staccato whatsoever in the left hand at all. Also, the dynamic markings also need to be played clearly. At the end of this movement, the poco ritardando bass arpeggio in F major resolves to B flat minor that begins the third movement. The third movement structure alternates two slow arioso sections with two faster fugues. In Alfred Brando's analysis, there are six sections, recitative, arioso, first fugue, second arioso, fugue inversion, and homophonic conclusion. This third movement perfectly demonstrates Beethoven's genius and innovation. The beginning recitative serves as a seamless bridge between the rough humor of the second movement and the sad meditation of the arioso. One question that we need to ask ourselves, how often do we hear recitatives and arias in piano music? Probably not too often, right? Well, there is a recitative in the Tempest Sonata, but the recitative here is much more substantial. The combination of recitative and arioso makes the opening of this movement almost operatic. We should not forget the fact that Beethoven was working on his famous Missa Solemnis at the same time when he was writing this sonata. As we play the recitative and two arioso sections, we need to remember that these are strongly vocally oriented sections. So singing quality and the legato touch are very important. The arioso leads into a three-voice fugue, whose subject is constructed from three parallel rising fourths, as we discussed earlier. This fugue should be taken at a majestically moderate pace. The beautiful three-part counterpoint is very carefully crafted, so we do not need to add anything unnecessary to Beethoven's markings. Crescendo only at where he writes, and keep the fugue piano until he writes forte or fortissimo. Beethoven's fugues always come to us as if from behind huge gates that open and shut without regard of our expectations. 
do not fail to mark the subject from its first note onwards, but do not neglect the counter subject. And pay special attention to all suspensions, as in measures 36 to 39. Brahms used to put his finger on the second note of every tight notes and say, it is here that it must sound. When the second Ariosa returns, Beethoven marked Ermatet, meaning exhausted or tired out. Beethoven's markings and phrasings are absolutely accurate and complete. We should not forget that the whole section is governed by the notion of exhausted. Therefore, the crescendos should not rise as far as in the first Arioso. This second Arioso is weary, is devastated. There's a famous bridge between this Arioso and the second fugue in measure 132. This passage is what Edmund Fisher described as the gradual resurgence of the heartbeat. These chords should be played with up gesture without accents, imitating the reviving heartbeat. The pedal should be used very carefully. On most modern pianos, half pedal or even less is ideal. Otherwise, the sound of chords will reverberate through rests. The second fugue is even more complex. There is inverted subject, stretto, augmented subject, as well as the diminution of the subject. I would advise students to take a pencil and really figure out which subject is what before putting hands on the piano. The concluding section of the piece returns to homophonic and also pushes the piece to its combination. It is a triumphal ending that is born from the devastation. Fugues are often being considered as looking back to the Baroque era and associated with being philosophical. Beethoven in his late years was very fond of writing fugues. In the third movement of Opus 110, the recitative and arioso sections are so human and fugue sections are so sacred. It always amazes me that Beethoven is so lofty and so human all at the same time. To wrap up today's lecture, I'd like to give some advice and share some of my own experiences to younger students. When we study a Beethoven sonata, always listen to his other compositions, especially in different genres, such as symphonies, string quartets, and that Misa Solomness mentioned earlier. When we practice, sing the phrase you are playing. Keep the beautiful melodies expressive but simple. Always, always listen to what you play. Be precise to the tempo, to the markings, to the score. Find out where is the climax, what is the structure, and what kind of color do I need in a certain passage. If possible, find the facsimile, which means the exact copy of the manuscript to study. Put everything into one sentence. Be truthful to the composer. Thank you very much for watching. Wish you and your loved ones safe and healthy. 大家好，我们今天将要讨论的作品是巴赫一小调《Partita》作品八三零。通过对这首组曲结构、舞蹈风格的根源进行研究，找到一些国际化的音乐元素。巴赫的一生大部分时间都在教堂中度过，他是一个虔诚的基督徒，所以巴赫宗教题材的作品很多。在1722年到1731年之间，巴赫创作了三套组曲，分别为法国组曲。
、英国族曲和帕提塔。帕提塔也被称为德国族曲。巴赫创作这六首键盘帕提塔的时候，也正是他作为教堂乐师最倒霉的时候。也许正是职场失意，激发了他巨大的创作潜能，从而写就了这部伟大的作品。在早期的文艺复兴时期，社交舞蹈得到了广泛传播，并受到高度重视。凡有教养的人，都要求经历此道。舞蹈成为了人们具备涵养、素质的象征。十六世纪末、十七世纪初，舞和乐已渐渐分家，成套的舞曲是后来器乐组曲的先驱。巴赫及同时代的作曲家所创造的舞曲，已不再依据舞蹈而作。这首一小调帕提塔由七个部分组成，这七个部分分别是：托卡塔、阿勒曼德、库朗特、旋律、萨拉班德、带加福特速度的小曲和及格。根据弗罗贝格尔奠定的键盘组曲形式。其中，阿拉曼德、库朗特、萨拉班德和吉格分别对应着中、快、慢速和最快速。我们将针对第六帕提塔组曲中的阿拉曼德、库朗特、萨拉班德和吉格做出一些分析。在十六世纪。阿勒曼德舞以序场舞的方式出现在德国宫廷舞蹈中，基本舞步摒除了以前的多种式样动作，从而转变为略显单调的舞步组合。右脚向右跨一步，左脚跟上；左脚向左跨一步，右脚跟上；右脚再向右跨一步，左脚跟上；最后，左脚向左跨一步并点地。跨步时可随意向侧前方或侧后方，但要气宇轩昂。也许是阿勒曼德舞的舞蹈动作过于枯乏无味，这种舞蹈于十七世纪中叶逐渐被人们从舞种中摒弃。人们仅仅记住这种舞蹈的音乐。同阿勒曼德以一个短上拍起步的特点一致。阿拉曼的舞曲也是由弱起的十六分音符开始，在这首曲子里面，第一个音是 G 音，伴随下一小节强拍的第一个音，构成一次同音重复。之后呢，所有的声部均参与十六分音符或是三十二分音符平缓而有规律的流动。曲目开头呢，我们在演奏的同时，需要去感受声音与声音之间的碰撞，在他们身上形成了光泽。这种光泽可以留在空气中，非常美妙。这种时候，周围的空气应该是静止的。下面是这部作品的开头部分。世纪时期，库朗特舞蹈用来表现一对对男女漫步之后，做出一系列谈情说爱的舞蹈动作。这种舞蹈与十六世纪进入意大利宫廷舞蹈的行列。舞蹈动作由原来吃力、粗鲁、伸直的单步和腹部跳转，变为具有宫廷侍城气质的滑行步跳和交叉步，具有一定的庄严气质。库朗特舞正式成为一种表现隆重礼仪仪式的舞蹈。我们可以通过一段舞蹈视频，对库朗特舞种有更清楚的了解，请欣赏。
在刚才的视频中，舞蹈演员们的服装精致华丽，舞步轻盈，与舞者的裙摆都很长很重，所以在跳舞的过程中，迈出的舞步并不会特别的大，表现出庄重、从容不迫的状态。库朗特的舞曲题材通常由弱起小节开始，伴随着紧跟其后的同音反复。做出一连串的等时值的附点节奏律动，比如说这首库朗特的开头，它的重复音是这个西。作品开头的弱拍可以理解为跳舞时我们抬脚的那个小动作，所以说弹得轻盈、典雅一点。在练习的过程中，右手不需要用太多敲击的力量，我们不需要把音色处理成，不需要太多的爆发力，反而要去找贴键时手指的凝聚力。左手呢，需要在低音的和声进行中找出八分音符连段之间有趣的表现力。不一定所有的八分音符都需要弹成 staccato 的状态。谱面上是这个样子的。我们可以借鉴巴赫为小提琴而做的 partita 中，小提琴演奏家们对于不同旋律而做出的八分音符演奏中的不同处理。通过左手音与音之间内在的联系与右手主旋律对话的关系，找出最适合自己的连段安排。比如说前四小节，我们不需要每一个音都弹成断开的状态，我们可以把前三小节的第一和第二个音做一个连奏处理。时候，我们可以把第二和第三个音做一个连段处理，这样合起来过后，是这个效果。这首库朗特继承了16世纪以来快速流动的三拍子舞蹈，所以演奏速度会相对较快。介于舞曲活泼轻快的性格特点，可以在每一小节的第一拍上用手腕和手臂稍微送一下。我们的第一个音用手腕送的话是这个状态，就是说这三个音我们在弹奏的过程中不需要保持在一个平面上，这样会产生一些呼吸和音色上细微的区别。另外，左手断奏停留的时间大约相当于本身音符一半的时值，而有顿音的地方，除了需要在力度上稍多一点以外，在琴键上停留的时间应该是本身音符四分之三的时值。最重要的一点是，谱面上八分音符延六的时值不得短于十六分音符。左手开头都是八分音符。我们在练习的时候，尽量避免弹得太短，以至于听众听起来已经是十六分音符的时值了。所以在练习的时候，我们应该分清楚断奏与跳音的区别。在平常的练习中，如果大家遇到了一些练习瓶颈，可以反思一下，会不会是每天在练琴的时候。对于单手的练习时间没有达到一个既定的量。一般来说，我们每天的练习应该是单手的时间大于双手的时间，慢练的时间大于快练的时间。另外，我们在参考音频的时候，应该多听演奏家们对于左手线条的处理。最后，为了使库朗特舞曲的节奏和韵律更加显著。可以在每小节的第一拍适量的加一些短促的踏板，起到润色点缀的效果。这样的演奏和左手的八分音符正符合16世纪。
扩囊特五步，活泼轻盈的感觉。萨拉班德由西班牙语 z a r a b o n t 演变而来。西班牙语的前缀 z a r a 指崇高、圣洁之意，后缀的 b o n t 为前行、行速之意，组合在一起，意为庄严肃穆的行列，专门指基督徒们为纪念耶稣受难的宗教场景。这首第六帕提塔组曲中的萨拉班德。是巴赫同体裁中最为深刻、震撼的一首。我们在视频中看到的行进式舞曲的特点，几乎在这首《萨拉班德》里不见踪影，但是却继承了萨拉班德舞曲装饰性特点。这首舞曲也是巴赫所有萨拉班德舞曲中最为丰富的舞曲之一。大量的装饰音如同一件华丽的外衣，覆盖着看似简单的旋律。乐曲开始于弱拍，并在第一小节的强拍运用不协调音。直至到第二小的第三拍才解决。这样的写作手法可营造出短暂的焦虑气氛效果。大提琴家罗斯特·罗波维奇说过：“我无法忘怀所有想要翻越这堵墙而丧生的人们。当我拉起萨纳班德，人群中有人哭了起来。”让我们通过一段舞蹈视频来进入萨纳班德的讨论。在练习的过程中，
我们需要充分的表现出旋律中的歌唱性，模仿清唱剧里女高音、女中音的声音。乐曲中还有很多附点节奏，要具有张力的去表达，庄重的气氛。曲目开头的声音很重要，我们需要找准准确的音色位置。第一，我们弹奏的声音要离我们很近，但是我们弹奏的声音的位置需要比较高。距离很重要，手腕的位置不需要特别的低。如果是我们压着手腕弹，声音就不容易弹成非常的嘎突的感觉。此舞曲为二段体，四三拍，一小调，结构可分为两个部分。第一段为第十一到第十二小节，第二段为第十三到第三十六小节。第二段的长度是第一段的两倍。此舞曲的最大特色是以和弦为架构，并加入装饰音与即兴的旋律线条，也运用了大量和弦外音作为和弦的延迟解决。第一段当中的转调有 G 大调、B 大调，而第二段当中的转调则有 A 小调、B 小调。转调手法均运用共同和弦调至近细调。最后，让我们来看一下 Partita 的最后一个部分——吉格舞曲。吉格组曲通常作为器乐组曲的最后一个乐章，分为英国吉格、法国吉格和意大利吉格三种。但到了十七世纪末，巴赫所写的吉格舞曲不再以地区划分，而是将乐曲结构、拍子记号及风格划分为 French Gig。Giga One, Giga Two， 请大家欣赏关于吉格舞曲的视频。第六组曲的最后一个乐章是一首赋格式的吉格舞曲，德文、法文中的 gig 意为跳跃，而在英文中为狩猎、追赶之意。巴赫在主题中大胆地运用了两次小七度和一次减三度，营造出一种紧张不安的气氛。第二部分节奏相同，且由主题的倒影协作而成。大家在练习的过程中，应该多在声部主题的表现上下功夫。以上就是我们对于演奏这首 Partita 需要了解的背景和音乐结构上的细节。不论练习巴赫的任何键盘作品，我们都能从作品中感到巴赫的认真、天才、谦卑。终极的艺术家是没有面目的，巴赫是极致的精美。看不见的 narrator， 谢谢大家。